Our main character's father always told him to live for the clan. By that, he meant that his son shouldn't have any desires and should follow his brother like a shadow. As knights approached, he remained motionless on his knees. He managed to fight off the strongest commanders on the continent by himself. A man by the name of Boris expected nothing less from Sion Vert, considering who he's related to. Sion drew his dark weapon and demanded to know if the Emperor put Boris up to this. Boris was disturbed by the black fog that surrounded Sion. It was just like the rumors said. Now he knew for sure that Sion is in fact an assassin from Mist. Mist is an enemy of the Knights of Light. Boris was looking forward to telling his superiors that he got rid of the scum himself. But his target dared him to try it. Boris was prepared to deal with Sion's secret power since he was being backed up by a ninth star magic barrier. Internally, Sion resolved himself to escaping and figuring everything out with his brother. He was ready to tear the barrier apart. But the approach of a man telling him to stand down changed everything. Sion was stunned. His father used to say that his brother Ashel is the clan, that his brother's success is his success. So he couldn't even speak when he saw none other than Ashel himself. Again, he dropped to his knees. Ashel noticed his confusion. Sion wanted an explanation. Ashel commended his brother for serving him and the clan well. Now, it was time for that burden to be relieved. Sion wondered if he did something wrong. Ashel blamed the dark fog that surrounds him, making him an inhuman killer. He pointed to his brother's sins and deception, which really pissed Sion off. The Empire's fight for succession, the Demon King army's raid, and even the war to unify the continent. Sion helped his brother do everything he set his mind to, because serving him was his life's purpose. Now, he was being abandoned after 20 years of grueling service. He didn't care about his body anymore and decided to give everything he had left, all to destroy Ashel. The surrounding troops could not believe that Sion still had so much mana left. He wondered if the hero wasn't ashamed about trying to kill his little brother out of fear. Now, Ashel was angry. Sion made his move. The two began to clash. All Sion needed was one good hit. If he can just hit Ashel's weak point, his brother won't be able to regenerate. Sion's attack hit a barrier while Ashel kept his back turned. This was Boris's barrier. In an instant, Sion was impaled and dropped his weapon. Ashel claimed to have sought a painless death since Sion is his brother. But then again, he believed Sion was a demon from the very beginning and never truly trusted him. The hero kicked his brother off. Then he and the others decided to leave. Sion lost. He wondered if this was where his foolish life ends. His eyes began to close. Suddenly, Ashel looked over his shoulder. Despite his wounds, Sion rushed in for yet another attack. His dagger raced towards Ashel's throat, and his brother eviscerated him in a flash of light. Afterwards, Sion woke up in a cold sweat. A maid wondered how long he planned on sleeping, and insisted that he prepare himself. Sion shot up, surprised to see Emily, his maid from 20 years ago, who looked exactly like she did back then. Then he recognized the room they were in too. He touched his own face and realized that he's back to being a kid again. Emily assumed that the young master was just stalling to avoid his training. But Sion wasn't sure what she was talking about. After confirming that he's returned to a previous version of his family's estate, Sion wondered if his life was flashing before his eyes or something. He's gone back 27 years. This is the year before he went to the academy. Every year, his father, the Duke, holds a training session that he personally attends. Today, Sion would be up against his half-brother, Kranz. Kranz's mother, Margaret, is his father's wife. So, although they're both the youngest children and the same age, Kranz received much more attention. Sion, meanwhile, was an illegitimate child. After losing this fight in the past, he became a joke to everyone. It's also the reason his father stopped paying attention to him. Even Emily didn't think Sion could win. 
When he drew his rapier, Sion was surprised by how heavy it felt. His strength was that of a child's. This entire experience was way too vivid to be a magic illusion. He figured that he might actually be in the past, so maybe he can change the future. Kranz expected his brother to run away. Once the fight began, he immediately went on the attack. But to Sion, the kid was painfully slow. He sidestepped the first strike. Kranz was frustrated and went for another. But he was effortlessly disarmed. Then Sion kicked him in the shin. Overtaken by pain, Kranz curled up on the ground. Sion knew that putting his sword to Kranz's throat would end things. But that would not be enough for him. Kranz used to bully his brother relentlessly, and that behavior continued at the academy too. So, Sion needed to teach this jerk a lesson. He lifted his leg, much to Kranz's horror. In this life, Sion would make his own path and live for himself. Kranz lost after receiving a beating that nobody will ever forget. The Duke ordered Sion to see him afterwards. He was escorted by Yulken, a high-class knight. When he saw Kranz's mother, he decided to mock her about her son's condition. Her anger was clear, but he brushed it off as the nature of a duel. But his smile fell when she began talking about his illegitimacy. She even badmouthed his mother. The Duchess had crossed a line. Sion wondered if he should kill her. No. He knew how to make her suffer, so he was going to take his time. Sion reminded the woman that he will be attending the academy with her son. He assumed that she'd want her kid to graduate with all his limbs, but maybe she's not as worried about Kranz as he thought. Margaret raised a hand to slap him, but Yulken stood between them since they need to meet with the Duke. After a cold stare, she was forced to back down. The Duke's orders are absolute. Sion greeted his father, who he hadn't met with one-on-one -on -one in 15 years. Duke Willius is known as the Guardian of the Continent. He used his incredible magic and wisdom to repel the invading demons for ages. But Sion also recalled his father dying in battle against the Demon King's army. His only desire seemed to be continental peace. Although the world remembers him as a great man, Sion believed his dad was stupid for spending his entire life serving others. The Duke was impressed by his son's swordsmanship and wanted to know how he learned. Sion claimed to have trained on his own every night, but since he never showed any interest in it before, his dad wondered why he hid his skills. Sion said that he didn't want to draw too much attention, but his duel seemed to contradict that. His father pointed out the unnecessary beating. Sion admitted that he wanted to prove that he's better than his brother, and assumed that was the purpose of the duel. Willius was very pleased by his son's level-headed thinking. He was sure that Sion would reliably support his brother Ashel in the future. Just his brother's name was enough to throw Sion off. As always, their father was obsessed with Ashel. Willius didn't notice and offered to reward Sion with whatever he wants since he won the duel. Sion resolved himself to destroy everything Ashel ever tried to do. Later, Emily was losing her mind over Sion's request to join the battlefield. After all, it's absolutely teeming with demonic beasts. Battles against demons have been waged there for centuries. The Duke would only let his son join if he's able to prove himself worthy in one month's time. Since he's still weaker than his peers, Sion would raise his physical strength as much as he can. Thankfully, he still has his battle sense and even a bit of magic. Moments later, a woman named Alice barged into the room. She angrily grabbed him by the collar of his shirt. She couldn't believe that he asked their father to join the battlefield. Since beating their brother Cran seemed to have gotten to his head, his sister Alice demanded that he follow her to the roof. If he can last against her for three minutes, she will let him go. But before then, she wanted to know if Sion was after the family's title. He wasn't interested at all, but didn't respond. So she took his silence as confirmation. This is still the same day he fought Kranz, so his body was feeling pretty tired. Alice made her move, and Sion managed to block it. She was not expecting that at all. And he didn't expect her to go all out against someone seven years younger than her. Alice's hand began to shake. She chalked it up to a fluke and gave him an irritated smile. 
Then she unleashed a flurry of strikes. This resulted in her pressing the weight of her longsword onto his rapier. Sion redirected her momentum and moved his blade closer. This was bad. Sion shifted again at the last second. Their attacks collided and they were separated by the force. Sion's fighting style is all about swift execution, so he had to stop himself from killing her. But it's hard to hold back since his physical strength is so bad right now. He was using mana to reinforce his sword, but was running low. Alice began chanting a six-star spell. She refused to lose. Sion knew that even if he blocks it, he'll fall off the roof. So he had to be the one to make the first move. Yulken leapt between them. He grabbed the young master and blocked Alice's high-level attack with his sword still in the sheath. Power surged into the sky. Yulken scolded her for going all out against a much younger opponent. Sion was betting on the interruption. Alice grabbed her little brother and begged for his forgiveness. Alice was an elite among elites who was perfect in all fields of study at the academy. She especially excelled in swordsmanship. Many expected her to inherit their father's title as guardian of the continent, just like Ashel, the duke's oldest son. But she was killed just after joining the Knights of Light. This time, Sion vowed to protect her. Alice wondered why the Duke's guardian knight hadn't left for war with their father. Yulkin admitted that he's secretly been ordered to protect Sion for a while. Sion noticed his tailing immediately, but he wasn't sure why his father gave that sort of order. Then he fell asleep from exhaustion. Alice went back to the academy since she only returned to see the Duke before she graduates. Sion spent two weeks working on his strength. But even after all that time, 10 push-ups is still his limit. He really missed his adult physique. Emily showed up with a smelly gift from Alice. Hellhound's blood is a rare item found on the black market. Most people believe the blood of demonic beasts is poisonous because of the terrible smell and the burning taste. But Sion knows that it permanently increases the mana and strength of whoever drinks it. So he gulped it down in one go. Now it was time to see if it worked. Yulken wasn't around because he needed to give his regular report. The God of Light once told Ashel about an ancient temple hidden in the mountains. But right now, Sion is the only one who knows about it. He couldn't wait to screw his brother over. Sion noticed that the God of Light's ancient temple looks a bit different from what he remembers. All of this land's history was erased by the God Demon War from 300 years ago. That's when he saw a familiar sword. Although demons are much stronger than humans, they were driven out from Belias thanks to relics known as the God's Weaponry. This sword is one of them and was blessed by the God of Light. It's believed to be the main cause behind humanity's victory. It's also the sword that killed Sion. He wondered if it had anything to do with his regression. He touched it, but nothing happened. So he kicked it and moved on to his real task. Because where there is light, there must also be darkness. A pathway was opened and led him to another familiar weapon. His demonic sword, Kram. A creature made of shadows began to rise. It loomed over him and rushed to take over his body. But Sion grabbed the monster by the throat. He wasn't very fond of this behavior. He reminded Kram that the sword belongs to him. She swiped her claws at him, then dashed out of his grip. She wondered who the kid was. Was this the successor? She sensed Eru's aura on him. Sion confirmed it. So it was time for her to bow down to her master. But Kram refused to accept a child. As they clashed, Sion remembers that the sword's final goal is to take over the user's body. He decided to go easy on her. He exerted his control over the sword, and she collapsed. Again, she didn't understand how this could be possible. Sion exerted his control again and again. After a while, she finally submitted to her master. Kram was excited to leave. She learned his name and wondered if Eru really chose him. Sion told her that it happened in his previous life, and that he's died before. But Kram didn't understand. They returned to the Holy Sword that would have to wait another 20 years before being claimed. Sion cut off the sword's pommel. 
which made it crash down. He wasn't really sure what he'd do with it, but figured it might make things more interesting. It was finally time for Scion to join the battlefront. His father gave him one more chance to back down, but Scion was determined. Yulken was ordered to use a magic scroll. It summoned a Hellhound, a low-ranked demonic beast. Scion needed to prove himself against it. Three days ago, Scion challenged Yulken to a duel. The knight suggested that he train with someone his own age. But Kranz runs away from him on sight these days. Yulken agreed to focus on defense and only use the sheath of his sword. Before they began, Scion ordered him not to tell the Duke about whatever happens. Scion's body blurred. He struck a defending Yulken. The blow was way too heavy to be that of a 10-year-old boy's. He was also really fast. Scion disappeared and re-emerged above and behind his opponent. Yulken's defense didn't waver for a second as they continued to collide. Scion prepared one more strike. He delivered the full weight of his rapier. But just like he figured, Scion still couldn't win against Yulken. The knight had to catch his breath, but was very impressed by the young master's growth. He was convinced that Scion would crush whatever challenges he faces. The Hellhound made the first move, but Scion was ready. As it closed the distance, Scion closed one of its eyes forever. Fighting a monster was still too much for his current strength, so he needed to finish this quickly. Scion slashed at its throat and launched his weapon from above. The men were stunned. Scion felt like this was a waste of perfectly good blood and considered keeping a cup on him. The Duke congratulated his son and awaited him on the battlefront. K-Ram was upset that he didn't use her. She could really go for a drink. Scion told her not to worry, because where they're going, he'll be sure to use her to his heart's content. The Duke led his men against a band of ogres. The monsters were snared by his magic, while the soldiers went on the attack. Emily was freaking out behind Scion. Once it was over, the Duke warned his son to never let his guard down in such a place. Battles like these are totally normal here, and the advanced knights are effectively border control against the monsters. Scion was stationed in the safest part of their encampment. At this rate, feeding his sword would be difficult. He prepared a body double to help him sneak out. Emily was also there to cover for him since she believed he was just doing his usual training. This was the only time he'd be able to move around freely. He went to an area he remembered being infested with monsters. Now, he could finally feed K-Ram, and she could not wait to cut loose. This time, he'd allow her to indulge. They tore through an entire pack of hellhounds. Then he immediately enjoyed a sip of their blood. It really hit the spot. They would spend the rest of the night like this, increasing their strength by gorging on monster blood. Elsewhere, a princess of the Empire was on her way to the battlefront. Her servant mentioned that the Vert family's youngest son would also be there. The princess couldn't believe that the Duke would bring a kid her age to such a place. But her servant explained that the boy actually volunteered. Then, she learned his name. Later on, the Duke and his men took down a bunch of aerial monsters, and Scion was with them. The Duke asked his son how it's been. He was pleased by the answer he received. He let Scion know that he is very proud of him. The Duke told his son to visit his tent early in the morning so they can talk. Scion had never seen his father be so kind before. Soon after, Scion was alone and struggling against a death worm. Since he was struggling, K-Ram offered to take the lead instead. But Scion knew that she just wanted to steal his body. The monster was regenerating after each attack. Scion has been on the front lines for a month now and has had plenty of demonic blood. But it's still not enough, so he decided to give in. He would entertain K-Ram's plan for now. Manifesting her power, he cut the worm all over. Once he was airborne, it was time for the finisher. A downward strike that cut it to pieces. After that, the Duke and his men investigated the monster bodies that were left behind. The sword traces seemed familiar to the Duke. Then he saw what was left of the Death Worm. He feared that it may have been the work of a certain organization. Demonic Sword Manifestation allows K-Ram to take over Scion's body and use her real power. But this runs the risk of her taking over his body. 
So, using it against a random monster was really crazy. If he had done it before drinking so much demonic blood, Sion's body would have broken down. K-Ram finally understood that her master just looks like a kid. He's actually a regressor. He kind of already told her that, so he didn't see why she was only catching on now. She was sure that killing someone like him must have been very hard. So she assumed that either he died in a duel or was betrayed. And since he seems to hate the Holy Sword so much, she figured that betrayal was more likely. Now she knew that he was after revenge. But she also let him know that if he ever loses, she will devour him. Sion knocked her aside and reminded K-Ram to know her place. But he was actually glad to see that she's just like he remembers. When Sion left his tent, he could tell that everyone was on edge. Emily told him about the high-level monster corpses. Then, Yulken was there to escort him to the Duke. Sion really didn't want to attract this sort of attention. He was worried that the Duke would figure out that he's the one responsible. When the Duke asked him what he was doing last night, Sion said that he went to bed early. His father wondered if he was overthinking the slash marks he saw on the monsters. It was illogical to believe such a young child could have killed a death worm. So instead, he pointed to his suspicions about the secret assassins of Mist being responsible. Mist is an ancient organization with unknown goals. They are responsible for killing countless nobles in the name of purification. They're also known for the black fog they leave behind, but suddenly disappeared one day. They haven't been seen in 300 years, but the death worm was shrouded in black fog. And the source of Mist's power is the god of darkness, Eru. Sion was impressed that the Duke was able to figure out so much despite the organization's obscurity for hundreds of years. He couldn't explain their motives, but would be sure to inform the Empire. Thanks to those suspicions, Sion was left off the hook. From there, the Duke brought up the fact that the Emperor would be visiting them today. With that in mind, he had a favor to ask. Later, the Duke bowed to his Emperor, but was greeted as an old friend. The Emperor was impressed to see that even the Duke's youngest son was strong enough for the battlefront. In his past life, Sion wasn't allowed anywhere near the Emperor, so his father's trust meant a lot to him. The Emperor introduced his own child, the Empire's fifth princess, Arin Severus. During their meeting, the Duke asked Sion to escort her for the day. In his previous life, Sion remembered occasionally seeing her between classes at the Academy. He could tell that his dad wanted him to develop a friendship with the princess like the one he has with the Emperor. But Sion was pretty sure that that sort of thing would be impossible with her. Although, he can't really say that since only he knows the future. So for now, he'll just play along. Arin asked him why the river is so red. He explained that old and injured demonic beasts jump into the Blood River. The decomposition of their mana turns it red. They also drink and bathe in the stuff. It even leads to the Demon Realm, which led to Sion teasing her about the Demon King. Just then, they received a signal that meant demonic beasts were on their way. The Duke prepared to protect the Emperor, but his old friend wanted some of the action, and the Duke had to comply. He also ordered Sion to join the battle. Arin was shocked, but since Sion can handle it, she insisted on sticking around. When she started throwing a temper tantrum, Sion called on Yulken to escort her back to the camps. In response, Arin tried to pull rank on Sion since she's a princess. Sion got real close and let her know that dozens of knights might die thanks to her stubbornness. He wondered if she was prepared to take responsibility for all those lives. When the princess buckled, he told her to head back if all she can do is cry. Their forces were up against giant slug monsters. The Duke commanded his men to protect the Emperor and eliminate all the monsters. The Emperor had two wives. His first wife, Diana, is dead. His second wife, Cassandra, is the Empire's prominent judiciary. The first Empress was mother to the first prince and second princess, while the current Empress is mother to the third and fourth princes. Arin, the fifth princess, is the daughter of a peasant mistress. Although she was treated poorly, Arin played her role and devoted herself to her studies. But eventually, she was framed for treason, exiled, and died alone making her the tragic princess. The Emperor was using Holy Lightning against the monsters. He has an 8-star magic rank, and would have probably been the head of the Mage Association if he wasn't a ruler. 
After the battle, the Emperor spoke to his duke in private about a rise in noble assassinations. Each of the dead nobles was a corrupt official. Black fog was also found at every crime scene. The duke told him about the dead monsters they found, and was told to look into it more. There are also some foul rumors about the fifth princess being responsible. The Emperor believes that a group is trying to use his daughter. So as a friend, if he ends up dying first, he wants the Duke to take care of Arryn in his stead. The Duke swore to do so. At the same time, just before Sion left his tent to train, Arryn showed up to talk. She apologized for her behavior, and he apologized for his rudeness. The princess admired his credibility and maturity. She tried to offer her friendship, but Sion refused. He didn't believe he'd be any help to her. She wondered if he also thinks she's just a shell of a princess. With her head hung low to hide her tears, she apologized for wasting his time. She thought they'd at least be able to talk. But it's clear that he is totally different from his brother Ashel. That made Sion's bloodlust surge. He swiftly turned and grabbed her arm. With a tight grip, he demanded to know how she knows his brother. Wincing, Arryn explained that she met him while touring the academy last year. He gave her advice about ignoring what others think and dutifully fulfilling her role as a princess. Sion immediately recognized the deception. He could tell better than anyone that Ashel had been manipulating her from the moment they met. Now he understood that his brother was the one behind the princess's downfall. Sion prepared to warn her, but was interrupted by a warning from Emily. Just then, a massive pillar came crashing down. Emily was swept back by the pressure. All she could do now was cry out for the young master as the ogre continued to loom. The emperor and duke were told that monsters attacked the rear camp while a princess was there. Her father commanded the entire army to secure his daughter's safety. Although, he wondered who she was looking for in the rear camps. It didn't make sense for advanced rank monsters to be here. Sion wondered if it was somehow his fault. Emily was happy to see that he's still alive. He killed the Demon King in his past life, so surviving this was nothing. The princess blamed herself for endangering the knights that are sworn to protect her. They tried to reassure her, but a monster grabbed one of them like a toy. Sion defended the princess. Once the creature tossed the knight away, he was sure that it was after him. So Sion volunteered to distract the monster while Emily gets the princess to safety. Sion attacked first. K-Ram explained that drinking so much demonic blood has affected Sion's scent enough to attract them. He wondered why she was only telling him this now. K-Ram reminded him that she's after his body. Sion grabbed her and prepared to put the weapon to work. He made his move and severed an arm. Then he claimed its head. He'd enjoy a lot more advanced rank blood. But he was distracted by one creature in particular. A devil dragon. K-Ram could tell that it was just a baby. Either way, Sion intended to devour it all the same. Elsewhere, the Emperor took down another ogre. They still weren't sure where their noble children were. Although, the Duke was more worried about the princess than his own son. Arryn showed up moments later and begged her father to save Sion. The Duke asked Emily if something has happened to his son. Emily had never seen him look so scary before, but still managed to explain. A knight offered to go with others to save the young master. The emperor urged his friend to hurry, but the duke refused. Everyone was stunned. He made it clear that they need to focus on reconstruction. Otherwise, the empire would be in danger. As for Sion, he's fulfilled his duty as a vert by ensuring the princess's escape. Arryn could only blame herself. Just then, they all heard the shriek of a monster overhead. It was a dragon. But Arryn noticed something else. Sion was holding onto its leg. Dragons are rare and noble creatures believed to be the closest thing to the creator. Although it's an honor for humans to interact with them, this wasn't exactly ideal for Sion. The princess cried out to him. Her father was in total disbelief, but he also wondered why the duke wasn't going to save his own son. Sion carved through several other monsters in pursuit of the dragon. He could tell by its size that the dragon wasn't fully grown. It launched a massive breath attack the moment he got too close. An angry Sion retaliated with a slash to the creature's face. It immediately shoved him back with a gust of wind from its beating wings. 
Zion ran his blade all over its body, forcing it back down. He could tell that it was too soon for him to beat a mature dragon in a fight. It was time for him to finish things. When the dragon flew up again, Zion refused to fall for the same trick twice. But to his surprise, the dragon was actually flying away. So he leapt up and latched onto it. In the present, K-Ram wondered why her master wasn't doing anything. Zion yelled that he didn't want to blow his cover. This resulted in an argument. Zion did not want to be crucified for his unsavory powers. And he didn't exactly have a plan just yet. Below, his father began using advanced 8-star magic. The Duke was going to slay the dragon, even if it meant destroying his son too. The dragon evaded several blades. One of them managed to hit, knocking Sion off. The dragon continued to fly away, which was a total waste to Sion. But he still couldn't afford to use his power with everyone watching. Thankfully, he had something else in mind. He fell headfirst into the Blood River. Elsewhere, a man was surprised to see a devil dragon flying around in such an area. His attendant explained that it's a young one that got lost and wound up in a bit of trouble. His master figured that there must be strong demonic beasts in that direction. The attendant explained that the culprits were actually humans. Humans beating a devil dragon was too unbelievable. Even so, he could feel a strange yet familiar energy. The attendant told his master to check it out since he's curious. But he also warned him to try not to kill everything out of boredom. His master agreed and flew away. Zion slowly emerged from the filthy river. He called out to K-Ram, but she wasn't very happy with him at the moment. She told him to pull himself together since they're in the demon realm. Sion tried telling her that there was nothing to worry about in the area, but was interrupted. The voice he heard was unforgettable. The figure wondered if he was human. This is the Demon King, Belcarion. The Demon King was known as the embodiment of evil. Zion readied his weapon and cursed his bad luck. The Demon King was frustrated by the lack of an answer. He surged behind Zion and questioned if the kid was looking for a fight instead. A desperate Zion quickly turned and slashed at the king in vain. But he did manage to cut a strand of the king's hair. Velcarion started laughing. Now he believed the rumors about humans having infinite potential. When Zion told K-Ram who they were up against, she didn't see any way for them to win. Sion was shaking. Velcarion told him to calm down. It wasn't like he was going to pick on a child. He even decided to lay down to sell the point. Sion was really confused. The Demon King asked his question again. This time, Sion confirmed that he is a human. He also explained that the water current brought him here. Velcarion mentioned the boy's weird aura, but Sion insisted that he's just a normal human. The Demon King got the feeling that the kid knew him somehow. Sion clarified that they have never met before. The Demon King accepted his answer since he's never actually seen a human himself. This guy was totally different from the Demon King Sion remembered. He asked the man why he was here. Velcarion mentioned the weird feeling he got and the fact that he is the Demon King. But he quickly realized that Sion was not surprised at all by his position. Now he knew for sure that Sion definitely recognizes him from somewhere. While Sion really couldn't believe that this was the same guy from his past. If events play out like they did in his previous life, the demon's invasion would soon begin. But if this is really the same Demon King, he had to wonder what caused him to change so drastically. He asked the Demon King what he seeks to accomplish. Valkyrion admitted that he just wants his people to live good lives and eat well and he'll slaughter anyone that gets in his way. Sion felt a shiver run down his spine. In that moment, he felt the unmistakable terror of the Demon King. He needed to prevent Velcarion from turning his power against humanity. So, he decided to make a deal with the Demon. Sion warned him that a threat to his people would soon arrive. That something would cause a great war between humans and demons. Velcarion stood up in outrage. Sion wanted the king to promise not to start a war no matter what. Velcarion had trouble understanding, but decided to entertain the thought. Sion promised to help him in return, that no matter what happens, he'll do his best to help the Demon King. Velcarion leaned in towards him, 
He was sure that the boy knows something major. He asked for the kid's name, and Sion gave it. With that, Belkarion promised not to invade humanity's lands, as long as Sion holds up his end of the bargain. After the deal was complete, Sion was discovered by the inspection team. He became known as the boy who survived the Devil Dragon. He was then taken to an abbey that was converted into a military hospital. The fifth princess was there to see him. She asked him to swear himself to her. Sion flat out refused. This left the princess trembling and in tears. Sion was really getting sick of her, but he still couldn't get over the fact that his brother was somehow involved in her tragic end. He made it clear to the girl that she really is as worthless as she believes. However, he plans on watching her from a distance until she becomes someone worth caring about. The princess seemed to take this in stride. She vowed to become so powerful that he wouldn't be able to ignore her. Before leaving, she thanked him for surviving. In the winter, a man named Reynold Crimson held a glowing magic cube in the palm of his hand. But suddenly, he couldn't move his body at all. This item is a small dimension box, an artifact that allows for infinite storage. This masterpiece of the Mage Association has yet to hit the mainstream. Sion had been keeping an eye on it for an entire year. He took it from the Seven Star Magic Knight, who suddenly recognized him. Reynold asked the noble why he was here as the contents of the box were released. Sion knew that they were smuggling demonic blood and selling it on the black market. He assumed that this was how his sister was able to get the Hellhound blood for him. Reynold began casting a spell once he regained a bit of movement. He hurled a torrent of flames at Sion. He was shaken by the validity of the rumors surrounding the youngest Vert. But the moment he caught his breath, his hand was severed. Reynold cried out in pain. Then he noticed the black fog in front of him. Sion grabbed the man by the throat and slammed him into a tree. He was given a choice. He could tell Sion everything he knows and die comfortably, or he could suffer a death so terrible that even the devil would pray for him. Later, at the Western Border Trading Post, two smugglers were pleased by their plentiful haul. But soon, they were horrified. They found Sir Reynolds' severed head. Sion assumed that a warning would be enough to deter them. Reynold Crimson was smuggling the blood of demonic beasts from the front lines under the Empire's nose and giving it to the Mage Association. The Association intends to surpass the limits of humanity. For now, they're making useful items like the Dimension Box. But in the future, they'll go to major extremes with the blood of demonic beasts. Kram mocked her master for acting like a heroic vigilante. Sion retorted that he just doesn't want others to make use of demonic blood. Somewhere in the Empire, Ashel read that Sion went to the front lines with their father. The woman in his bed wondered if he was talking about his half-brother. The eldest son confirmed it. Sion's been getting on his nerves. So it's time for him to pay his little brother a visit. Emily was excited to leave the front lines and join Sion at the Academy. But for him, the Academy is much worse since it's full of politics and schemes. Emily really hoped she'd be able to get some romance in her life. When Sion returned to his family home, he ran into a terrified Kranz. His half-brother bolted immediately. When Sion entered the estate, all of the servants bowed to greet him. This had never happened before. They hadn't so much as glanced at him in the past. Clearly, a lot has changed in only a year. When Sion held the doorknob to his room, he felt a horribly familiar aura. It shook him to his core. He already knew who was on the other side. Ashel greeted him with a smile. Sion tried to calm himself down. Ashel wondered if Sion remembered him. After all, they haven't seen each other since Ashel left for the academy. Sion quickly dismissed any attempts at controlling himself. He pulled out Kram and was ready to kill. Internally, the demon weapon urged him to get a grip. This wasn't the right time. Thankfully, Sion managed to suppress his feelings. He bowed deeply and greeted his older brother. He let Ashel know that he would never forget his older brother's face. This prompted Ashel to ruffle Sion's hair. He was happy to be remembered. Ashel spoke of Sion's improved swordsmanship. 
along with the expectation that his brother would soon join him on the battlefield. Sion forced himself to speak joyously at the prospect, but Ashel seemed to notice something. He admitted that he came back home just to see Sion. Sion knew that his brother wouldn't even look in the direction of someone he considered worthless. Knowing Ashel had some sort of objective here helped him calm down. He smiled and lied about missing him too. Emily was struggling to carry all their luggage. When the door opened, she prepared to give him a piece of her mind. But instead, she ran into Ashel. He expressed his pleasure at knowing how close she is to his brother and told her not to change on his account. They both bowed to the first young master as he departed. Emily was still freaking out, while Sion was solemn. He asked his maid to give him some space for a while. When she spoke back, he told her not to make him repeat himself. Stunned, Emily left him alone. Inside, Sion began throwing up. He asked Kram why she stopped him back there. She felt like he should be thanking her. He was pretty sure that that was a good opportunity for her to take over his body. Kram made it clear that she wants his rage to grow before then. Her familiar response made him smile. Elsewhere, a man approached another room. Ashel invited him in. The agent managed to track down Alice's location as requested. She is currently in the territory of the White Elves. Ashel was impressed by his sister's social skills since the elves are not keen on outsiders. He wanted to be informed when she seems to be returning. His agent wondered if something good happened in his absence. Ashel questioned what gave him that impression. He seemed to be brighter than usual. Apparently, his meeting with Sion was amusing. Ashel corrected him. He's actually in a terrible mood. The man swiftly apologized. Ashel thought about the look Sion gave him. It was as if he was looking at a lifelong nemesis. Since Sion got on his nerves, Ashel decided to keep an eye on him. So the agent vowed to assign someone to do so. From there, Ashel sat alone, deep in thought. He wondered what his youngest sibling was hiding. Some time later, Emily expressed her disappointment in Sion. It turns out that he can only take a night escort to the academy. They quickly said their goodbyes, and Sion did not hesitate to leave. Emily told him not to feel bad, even if he gets bullied. This made Sion remember how she carried him on her back when he was only eight and sick with a bad fever. She was the only one who cared enough to bring him to the nearest doctor. If it wasn't for her, he probably would have died in some corner of the mansion. Sion expresses care for her by saying that she better be good or he'll kill her himself. She couldn't hear a word he said, but returned his smile with tears in her eyes. As they left, Sion took stock of the six intermediate class knights that were meant to escort him. He could tell that something was going to happen before he makes it to his destination. Once the sun began to set, two of the knights nodded to one another as confirmation. They told the young master that they'd be setting up camp for the night. They claimed to be close to the city. Sion told them to inform him when they're done. He already knew that they were lying. They are in the middle of nowhere. Sion casually strolled out when they called for him. When they surrounded him with readied weapons, he asked for the person responsible. Most of them grimaced, but one of them actually smiled. Sion reminded them that he asked a question. They didn't plan on telling anything to the dead. At the very least, they let him know that it wasn't personal. The one who smiled promised to make it as painless as possible. Sion dodged the attack. In the next moment, his attacker was headless. Sion repeated himself while wielding Kram. The many knights shook with fear. He wondered if they hadn't seen this coming. The sight was unbelievable. One of the knights tried to retaliate. He suffered the same fate as the first. Sion cut another two down. There was an attempt at escape, but Sion quickly shut that down too. This was hardly the work of an 11-year-old child. The final survivor finally understood how Sion managed to survive an encounter with a dragon. This mission was always doomed to fail. The last man fell over as Sion approached. Sion decided to make him the informant. The sobbing man immediately told him that the duke's wife was behind it. In the morning, they continued traveling. It turns out that the mission was due to a request from Kranz. Sion decided to teach his brother a lesson the next time they meet. The man questioned if Sion was going to kill him too. But Sion didn't notice any sadness. 
The coachman didn't believe he was entitled to any resentment since they were the ones who threatened Sion's life first. Hearing that, Sion told him to just focus on driving since that's what he's good for. The man thanked him with tears in his eyes. They finally made it to the central city. Back at the mansion, Margaret was furious. Six of the seven men meant to kill Sion were dead. She was assured it would be a simple task. They had clearly underestimated the young master, but Sion was still just a child. Her serpent was sure that there must be someone else behind the scenes. He suggested that they make another attempt at the academy, but Margaret was too concerned with her son's safety to try. She told him to stand down. Anyone who knows about this needed to be eliminated. Ashel's agent was secretly listening in. It's been 10 days since Sion left the mansion. Ryan's been serving him in the meantime. He'd have to figure out what to do with the guy once they make it to the academy. Once they were there, Sion considered how much of an impact the school had on his previous life. He presented his family crest to the front desk. He was surprised to learn that accommodations had already been prepared for him. He was sure that there must be some kind of mistake. Ryan couldn't believe it. Sion had been assigned to the Royal Hall. No one in his family has ever received such an honor. Someone was surely responsible. Once Brian confirmed that he'd brought all the luggage, Sion began reaching for something. Brian's role had been fulfilled. The coachman began shaking in fear. But then, a sack of coins landed in his hands. Brian was dumbfounded. Sion waved it off as payment for his services. It was enough for him to start a new life wherever he pleases. Although, Sion wouldn't recommend going back where they came from due to Margaret's reach. Brian froze. Then, he suddenly dropped to a knee and professed his name as a knight. He sought to serve Sion Vert for the rest of his life. The kid had no idea Brian was a knight. It turns out that he is so low ranking that he was assigned to menial labor. His father always told him that if he meets someone he can trust and serve forever, he should ask to do so without hesitation. Sion considered it a foolish notion. He asked Brian how he knows he won't betray him in the future. Brian was nervous, but exclaimed that even if that were to happen, he wouldn't mind. Sion put a hand on his shoulder and told the knight to never even consider betraying him. Then, he simply told the man to follow him to the elemental test. He didn't plan on attending the entrance ceremony. According to the tests, Arin Severus has a 2-star mana rank, a physical rank of B, and a 52% light affinity. Seth Chaharkhan has a 3-star mana rank, a physical rank of A, and a 71% sand affinity. The Dean was rather impressed by these two, but one student was even more astounding. Sion Vert has a 1-star mana rank, a physical rank of S, and a 92% dark affinity. Instructor Serica mentioned how even Sion's sister Alice, who's known as God's Child, only had an 88% water affinity by the time she graduated. However, his element being darkness was certainly cause for concern. Furthermore, Sion was assigned to the Royal Hall. This was actually an order from the Emperor. He did it because Sion saved his daughter on the front lines. The Emperor is even thinking about having the two of them get married. The fifth princess, believed to be a failure, could potentially marry into the Vert family, a house that has never failed to raise exceptionally talented people. But something like that could cause succession issues to increase. It could lead to an all-out civil war. For now, all they can do is observe. Sion could either become the hero of the Empire or its downfall. In his previous life, Sion's dark affinity was somewhere in the 80s. He wondered if the difference was due to drinking so much demonic blood. He ran into Kranz in the hallway along with another boy. The other boy wondered if this was a kid Kranz treats like a slave. This is Popper, the son of a Marquise from the Garam Kingdom. He immediately made fun of Sion for not knowing his own mother. In Sion's previous life, Popper bullied him just as much as Kranz did. Sion was delighted to see him. Popper decided to use Sion as a punching bag. 
Meanwhile, Kranz was terrified and tried to talk him out of it. Scion kicked the bully right into a wall. Kranz could only cry out for his friend. With that out of the way, Scion decided to have a little talk with his brother Kranz. He gripped the terrified boy's shoulder. Scion doesn't care what the kid does behind his back. But if he ever sees the brat again, Kranz will be graduating in a wheelchair. Scion got the feeling that his academy life would be pretty fun. Instructor Serica decided to keep an eye on Scion. The book she was looking for was missing. Scion had it in his hand behind her. Serica wasn't able to detect his presence. She cheerfully wondered how a student made it into this restricted area. She asked him to give her the book since it's an important part of her research. Scion agreed with a smile and handed it over. A blade of darkness rushed towards his face and split the book in half. Scion asked if the book wasn't to her liking. He already knows about her identity as a hallmaster of the Mist organization. In his previous life, Serica approached him as a counselor that was concerned about his growth. Since he was being bullied by his brother at the time, Scion had a hard time taking her seriously. But that changed when she expressed her interest in him. She told him that his 84% dark affinity was rare, along with the fact that the dark element is misunderstood and that he has infinite growth potential. He was confused, but believed that she could help him. But now, he knows that he was being played for a fool. He would not fall for her pretty face, since being a teacher is just her cover. She's actually a missed assassin. Being a part of the academy gives her access to plenty of royals and nobles. Serica was willing to hear him out in her lab once he cleans up the scattered papers. Her reaction wasn't as dramatic as he expected. Once there, Scion happily pointed out that the tea she gave him is laced with poison. She returned his smile while saying that it's not so bad, it'll just melt his organs. But between the blood of demonic beasts and Emily's cooking, Scion was not worried in the slightest. He suggested that she try something a bit stronger next time. Serica wanted to know how he became aware of her identity, along with how he knew the exact book she receives her orders from. Scion thought it should be pretty clear by now that he is also a member of Mist. The Hallmaster mocked the kid for being so full of himself based on his elemental test alone. Scion mentioned the fact that plenty of nobles have been killed lately. He questioned when the purification project began. Serica feigned ignorance as her mana flared. Scion didn't back down and returned the gesture. Serica kicked the table at him. Scion raised a fist and accepted this as her response. He punched through the table. Serica was behind him with a weapon in each hand. There isn't a single member of Mist that she does not know about. Scion evaded, but the Hallmaster was just getting started. This forced Scion to use a weapon of his own. He parried her attack and charged in to prove himself. Serica defended despite her astonishment, but was hurled backwards. She recognized his weapon, but the demonic sword K-Ram can only be used by the one chosen by Eru. Zion wondered if this was enough to make her believe him. He assumed that the organization is currently searching for the successor, which was clearly true. Since he's exactly who they're looking for, he asked the Hallmaster to bring him to the God of Darkness, Eru. At night, Zion was brought to a random street in the city. Serica used a spell and revealed the path forward. She could tell that he wasn't surprised by the location of their base. This is the path to the altar he seeks. From here on out, he would be on his own. The interior is a unique realm created by Eru's power. This makes it much larger than it appears to be from the outside. But Scion noticed something. He repelled the many blades that had been thrown at him. Several missed assassins descended. Scion leapt back. He returned the blades to their senders while airborne. The assassins narrowly managed to defend themselves. This boy was truly amazing. They moved as one. Scion responded with a secret technique. They were all in disbelief. Scion physically manifested his bloodlust to attack them. The assassins retched as they struggled to breathe. They wouldn't be getting back up for a while. 
However, one of them was still standing. Sion summoned his power for another technique, but the stranger interrupted him before he could finish. They ditched their mask and pointed to his proficiency in their main skill. She could not hold back anymore. Sion was shocked. It was Serika. She begged him to reveal his true power. He created some distance between them. Serika's fascination was growing by the second, but Sion ran away before she could see anything else. Serika is a battle junkie. He already knew that she'd want to fight until one of them ends up dying. She insisted on fighting him. Her attacks were like a rushing storm. She finally got him to stop. Within this realm, his energy would be undetectable to anyone outside. Hearing that, Sion decided to oblige. He might end up killing her, but didn't mind that possibility too much. But then, his eyes went wide, and he collapsed. Aram manifested and told her master to rest. The demonic sword did not want to get involved, but was sure that the hallmaster knows who she is. Serika bowed. Kram was upset about her master being attacked, despite the woman being one of Aru's worshippers. Serika explained that she just wanted to confirm his identity as the successor. Kram responded that she could have called for her god instead. Now, she decided to accept this as a direct challenge against her. Serika smugly told the weapon to pay attention to the successor first. He seemed to be dying. Kram's current means of manifestation was rather crude. It was eating away at Sion's life force. Now she was upset with her master. Serika made it clear that she does not reject fights. Besides, she was way too excited by the prospect of fighting Kram. The living weapon was a bit creeped out. Sion finally stood on his own. He wanted to know why Kram decided to manifest herself. She told Sion to stay behind her while she teaches the Hallmaster a lesson. Serika was honored. Kram told her not to beg for forgiveness after they begin. Serika was thrilled by the possibility of that happening, but they were interrupted by Eru's declaration. A portal began to open. He commanded the Hallmaster to send the successor through. The time has finally come. Sion gets to meet Eru, the god of darkness. People often consider Eru to be an evil god. They say he kills without hesitation and justifies it as a considerate act. Eru's response is that they desired it. That no one can decide what is right or wrong to another person. If you can protect your ethics by dying, then that is enough. Although that might sound insane, Sion knew that the god was just trying to protect the weak. Which is why Sion considers him to be an idiot. Sion stepped through the portal and ascended towards the god of darkness. The deity asked Sion if he knows who he is. The boy confirmed it matter-of-factly. But since Eru doesn't recognize him, he wanted some evidence of Sion being his successor. Sion was sure that the god could sense the power of the fog within him. There are two ways to become Eru's successor. Either Eru gives the Mist Stone to a chosen person, or the Mist Stone chooses someone on its own. Since he doesn't know Sion, he assumed that the stone must have picked him. In fact, the Mist Stone disappeared from its altar a year ago. Eru was surprised to see that Kram was with him, despite their inability to find her. He also noticed that the light in Sion's eyes is far ahead of his age. Eru concluded that Sion is an outsider from a timeline he is not part of. Sion was confused by that. He assumed that the god was involved in his regression. Eru explained that he is not an all-powerful or all-knowing god. Such rights were taken away from him long ago. However, this was still pretty convenient for him. A perfect successor showed up on their own, which saves him a lot of time. But he also noticed that Sion had something annoying on his person. Recognizing the Holy Sword's pommel, he wondered if Kram was not enough for the kid. Sion let the god know that he doesn't have anything specific in mind for it just yet. He just thought that if the world doesn't know about its existence, it might become useless. Eru took note of the boy's sadistic mentality, but decided that it was none of his business. It was time to do his part. Eru channeled the darkness and asked his successor what he seeks to do with his power. In his previous life, Sion replied that he wanted to live for his brother Ashel. Although it was stupid, Eru and Serika weren't bothered by it in the past. The god simply told him that there is nothing more dangerous than blind faith. 
Sion considered the possibility that Eru already expected his pathetic end. He decided to play things differently this time. Sion told the god that he would be using the power purely for selfish reasons. Eru asked Sion if he's confident that he won't regret it. Depending on his response, Eru might kill him here and now. Sion let him know that regardless of the consequences, he will not follow anyone's orders. Eru wondered if Sion would tell him his plan. But Sion refused. Eru was disappointed, but was fine with it as long as Sion purifies his name. From there, he decided to have a quick chat with his daughter Kram. He teased her for changing so much. He was sure that she must really like her master. Eru smothered her with affection. He was trying to be nice to her since he doesn't have anything to give Sion. Eru gave her a smooch on the forehead. Something began to change. Kram's form suddenly shifted. She marveled at the fact that she now has a body. Sion noticed that it wasn't taking up any of his mana. Kram wanted to know what he'd done to her. Eru gave her some of his life force. From there, he just kept teasing her. The next day, they were in Sion's room. Seraka and Kram were not getting along at all. They were arguing over their closeness to Sion. It was a clash between his weapon and his mentor. Sion decided to go for a walk much to Brian's dismay. It's only a matter of time before the two of them go head to head. Sion went to relax in the city, but he began to smell the scent of blood. A student was tossed aside and began <coughs> coughing up blood. They were being bullied. One of the delinquents conjured a glowing orb. He forced their mouth open and prepared to feed the power to them. But this was interrupted by a loud voice. A white-haired girl considered him to be a sorry excuse for a noble. Barrett introduced himself as the oldest son of a duke from the Garam Kingdom and asked the stranger for their identity. Arryn introduced herself as a princess of the Empire. Barrett smiled. Now he was able to recognize her as the Empire's fifth princess. He towered over her as a greeting. Arryn wasn't feeling very friendly. She wanted the situation to be explained immediately. Barrett claimed that this was all just a misunderstanding. He turned to his victim and grabbed them. He asked the kid if they were being bullied. They denied the claim. Arryn told the kid that they don't need to hide it. Without looking at her, the student told the princess to leave since they're just playing around. Barrett began laughing maniacally. Arryn disregarded the explanation and decided to take the kid away. Barrett grabbed the princess's wrist. He told her to back off. The bully restated that Leximus told her to go away. Arryn told him that he'd better let go of her. Barrett was unfazed, but another boy interrupted them. Sion quickly swept the fool off his feet. Arryn was surprised to see him, but Sion was more shocked by the other kid's name. He couldn't believe that this was Leximus. In his previous life, he got into a fight in the Garam Kingdom. He defended against a heavy hit and was forced onto the defensive. The person he faced was Leximus Klein, the greatest swordsman on the continent. She was from the Empire, but joined the Garam Kingdom after graduation. Sion protected himself against several attacks. She carved through the ground with a single slash. Sion was caught off guard for a moment. She leapt up with a powerful overhead strike. But it was her turn to be shocked. Sion was above her. He slammed into her back forcing her to collide with the ground. He had been ordered by the Empire to kill her. Despite the original intent being assassination, their fight ended up being an official duel. Leximus was someone who reached the pinnacle of swordsmanship without mana. He did not want to fight such an opponent with stealth. In the present, she wondered why he was looking at her so intensely. Barrett was not happy about another person butting into his business. He recognized Sion from his reputation on the front lines and wondered if he wanted to join in on the fun. Sion was not amused. Using a mana marble like this can lead to the destruction of mana inside a person's body, but he decided to join them anyways. He created a dark mana marble of his own. Barrett was too stunned to speak. Sion lifted the swirling power overhead and wondered what the other kid was doing. He callously told the bully to open up wide. Later, Leximus was mostly healed and bandaged up, but would still need some time to fully recover. The girl was very thankful, but didn't know how she could possibly repay the debt. 
Arin boasted about Sion and told the kid not to worry about it. Sion knew that the girl had several fractures and a concussion. Her endurance was impressive. Leximus wondered if Sion knows her since he keeps staring at her. Sion claimed that it was just a mistake and apologized. Leximus bashfully told him not to worry about it. Arin wanted to know where the kid's dorm is. She was worried that the bullies might come back for revenge. Leximus told her that she lives in Commoner Hall. She's a peasant. She was able to enroll thanks to instructor Veltane. He promised her financial support, but was suddenly fired. With no one left to support her, Sion realized that she might have to leave the school. Arin felt bad for the kid. Sion told her that she can just give Leximus the position she tried to give him. He also suggested that she learn some swordsmanship from her too. Arin was really confused since she's pretty sure that Leximus is a dude. But Sion was certain. The princess took a moment to process that. Leximus apologized for the confusion. Having short hair and wearing a boy's uniform was just more comfortable. It's actually a common mistake. Arin felt like a failure of a woman for not realizing when even Sion knew. Regardless, she wanted to know what Leximus thinks about Sion's idea. She wouldn't have to worry about bullies anymore, could learn whatever she wants, and live a comfortable life. Leximus wondered why she was being considered for such an honor. Arin expressed the fact that she doesn't like being alone. Leximus thanked her. She vowed to become someone the princess can be proud of, and thanked her again. Arin told her not to mention it since it was Sion's idea in the first place. But when she turned, Sion was already gone. Sion felt like he had done enough and decided to leave the rest to Arin. Now he understood that Leximus left the Empire because she lost her mana due to Barret's cruelty. The strongest swordsman on the continent still having her mana would be difficult for even him to win against. For now though, his priorities are elsewhere. Serica gave him an order from Mist. It is time for his first purification mission.